I think the world needs a SpongeBob musical. What is so appealing about SpongeBob to such a broad demographic is an optimism at his core. I'm a fan, dude. This is not like made up. We are drawing on the biggest pop stars in music today. We got songs from a lot of people. We are making the show in the spirit of SpongeBob himself. That is here to say, let's have the best day ever. Broadway's best creative minds reimagine and bring to life the beloved Nickelodeon series with humor, heart, and pure theatricality in a party for the eyes and ears. Be there when SpongeBob and all of Bikini Bottom face catastrophe until a most unexpected hero rises to take center stage. The show has recently been nominated for 12 Tony Awards, so uh, let's kick this off and we'll get into the songs here. We're going to start out with a song called BFF. Here we find SpongeBob and Patrick shortly after the citizens of Bikini Bottom have learned that a nearby volcano, Mount Humongous, will erupt the following day and destroy the town. I lost my place. There we go. To Patrick's distress, his friends are stuck at home without a TV, but SpongeBob shows his friends that imagination can get them through any crisis. Here to sing BFF, please help me welcome Curtis Holbrook and Brian Ray Norris. Glasses on to see we're both pretty lucky Stuck inside with no TV No, still I'm stuck with you So I'm as happy as can be Let's have some fun together We'll be best friends forever BFF, that stands for us But nothing's as fun as mindless entertainment Maybe so but all I know is right here we've got all we need to make today pretty special. Let's explore, open every drawer. Hey, you found my long lost cheese. Well, that's what friends are for. Let's have some fun together. You're my best friend forever. F, F, that stands for We're best friends and this is the friends and We're best friends and this is the friends and We're best friends and this is the friends and We're best friends and Every little thing that I can think of doing just sounds better Doing it together Every little thing that I can think of doing just sounds better Doing it together Doing it with you Hey Patrick, since you're so into bubbles I'm gonna make you the biggest, baddest bubble ever Floating high, like a bubble in the sky Feeling good just like I should And you're the reason why Let's have some fun together We'll be best friends forever BFF, that stands for us This can't get any better You're my best friend forever that stands for us BFF that stands for us BFF that stands for SpongeBob and Patrick that stands for us So Brian, you stay up here. We're gonna get to the, no the next song called Daddy Knows Best. All citizens of Bikini Bottom have different responses to crisis. Mr. Krabs, owner of the most popular restaurant in town, the Krusty Krab, sees an opportunity to make some quick cash. Here we find Mr. Krabs as he attempts to teach his daughter, Pearl, about what's most important in life. Here to sing Daddy Knows Best again is Brian and Jalen Josie. When time is short and the end is near It's important to identify what you hold dear It's clear, Pearl, your daddy always knows best You don't understand me, I know we're not of the same species Which Let me show you what counts more than all the rest 
money, money matters most. Money, money, I can boast. Money, money, make a toast to money, money, money. Ha! I should be my daddy's greatest prize, but instead he's got dollar signs. I'm sorry, bro, you trying to say something? Very, very cool. All right, so uh, awkward transition to some seating stuff. Uh, I guess, yeah, we'll just do it this way. Everybody else come on stage. We're also uh, welcoming two more to the cast, Lily and uh, Curtis. How you doing? Wesley. Wesley, sorry, Wes. <laughs> Curtis is over there. Curtis is over there. How dare you. How dare you, yes. Get evil on me. Uh, go, uh, have you two introduce yourselves, please, so we can get... Uh, My name is water. Wesley Taylor. I play Sheldon J. Plankton. The evil one. And I'm Lily Cooper. I play Sandy Jennifer Cheeks. <laughs> um, does anybody need water, Brian, after you're singing like that? Yeah. You, sure. You're good? All right. All right. Sorry, we actually forgot to set the water, so. There Get we go. Me one. Behind the scenes, live theater. Um, getting. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Just put that, put that anywhere. <laughs> it's going well. It's going really well, guys. <laughs> At least she sings pretty. <laughs> Jalen was, uh, what'd you call her, 12 out of 10 earlier? Yeah. She was on. She yeah, was she, on. She's she was really on excited to be here. They've all had Google food, and um, they're all a little hyped up. Um, did any of you actually watch SpongeBob when you were younger? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did too. It was like yesterday for Jalen. <laughs> yeah. Growing up. I mean, yes. Growing up. Yes. Yeah. Growing up. So, I did. I totally did. Do you, do you guys remember Zanga? It was like pre the blog? MySpace. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You could like theme your pages, and mine was SpongeBob themed when really? I was in junior high school. Yeah. Wow. So coming into these characters, did you have any preconceived notions of what SpongeBob would be or what the characters would be? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I actually didn't uh, grow up watching this show. I, I was more of like a Doug Grugrats uh, yes. generation. Um, but then. SpongeBob was after, and I, I would see it in the background of, you know, on the TV and the sort of periphery, and I, I recognized that it was a clever, uh, smarter than the average cartoon. Uh, and when I I got offered a reading, not the part, but a reading, um, the final workshop before Broadway, and so I drilled Doug Lawrence, the voice actor for Plankton, in my ear for weeks and just tried to, like, get it perfectly. And then I got to the reading, and Tina Landau, our director, was like, we're not going to be doing impersonations. We're going to split the difference and bring, you know, a human interpretation to the... Pay homage, of course, to the cartoon, mm -hmm. but um, bring ourselves to it. Um, that wasn't the question. That, that was actually a really good question. Like, where you are now, give us a sample. Can you give us an example of, like, a line where you are now versus where you wanted to take it originally? Yeah, that is good. Um, so, like, my first line in the show is, Quiet, computer wife, this time it'll work! I'll, you know. Uh, you know. You know. Uh, but, but I try to bring a little bit 
uh, more well. For the intro, I think it's important to establish the voice right. um, to, to help uh, adjust people's ears from the cartoon. Mm-hmm. But then you can sort of scale back um, the more you're on stage and bring a little bit more humanity to it in, in your own voice. So I try to split the difference between this voice that you're hearing right now and, and the voice that I just did. And were any challenge? I guess was it any challenges for the physicality going from a single-celled organism to multicellular? Uh, yeah, they put me in like this incubator that shrinks me every single night. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's like really about just like using your imagination. And, and again, we adjust people's eyes um, at the very beginning. My intro, I have like a finger puppet that's like a tiny little plankton. And then we get rid of it um, like within the first 60 seconds of that intro so that people can like get it. And mm-hmm. uh, I think in Chicago, he had the finger puppet like the whole show. And I really voted to get rid of it because um, I think we need to treat our audience like they're a little smarter than that. Right. Um, and I think, yeah, they totally get it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So for the rest of you, uh, did anything change between... <laughs> Jalen, you're like mesmerized with these captions. <laughs> <laughs> this is when it, they're like really going fast. <laughs> <laughs> Careful what you say. It's going to get written down yeah. there. Okay, so for the rest of you, the difference... <laughs> the difference between where you are now and where you originally uh, saw the character or thought the character would be, is there a big difference for any of the rest of you? Um, I've, <laughs> uh, so I, I play Sandy, which is a squirrel, she's a squirrel, and she lives underwater, and on the, on the cartoon, she's in an astronaut helmet so that she can breathe underwater, because she's a land mammal, and she has lungs, and, uh, in the Broadway show, instead of being in an actual glass bubble, I wear, uh, an, an afro, which is just really awesome and rad to be able to rock an afro on Broadway every night and uh, it's sort of representational of the silhouette of the character and um, sort of similar to what Wesley was talking about like I I even got a note last week where Tina our director was like okay so just like bring it down a little bit because the pitch of my of my character is very squirrely and so she always reminds us to like ground ourselves in reality. And I always like to think of our characters as our human versions of these characters. So yeah, you like watch the show and you sort of think of these like cartoony things and you think of how can I make this the most cartoony version of this character. But what we really want is to tell a relatable story and to make it more human than cartoony. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for me, it's a little bit different. I'm I'm actually in the ensemble of the show, and I play. I mean, I have like 23 costume changes in the show. We're like running around doing crazy things. Um, but I understudy SpongeBob, um, and so I've had the opportunity to go on quite a bit over the last couple months. And Tina, our director, has talked to me about about my version of SpongeBob versus versus Ethan's version, which have to be two different things. I can't be doing an Ethan. SpongeBob impersonation, you know, because that's just not gonna like pop off the stage as much as you know my version of the thing. So I thought initially, you know, of doing this like charactery version of SpongeBob, and she every time she's come in, she's just stripped it away more and more. And she's actually come up with this thing of talking about having a dial, and she will tell me on specific lines, okay, SpongeBob voice at a nine there. On this line, SpongeBob voice at a two, um, and it, so it's, it, it's you know, in a, at first you're like, oh my gosh, that is insane to have to think about it that specifically, but it's super super helpful actually. Um, and what we found is that we can establish the voice and the character in the beginning, and then through she she calls it SpongeBob growing up throughout the show and the journey that he's on and how he's having to really become the hero and the man to save the day. And so his SpongeBobby, you know, boy voice sort of goes away throughout the evening. Hmm. Um, so it's just another thing that Tina has, you know, come up with in a way of telling the story. Tina also nominated for Best Direction of yes. a Musical, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Jalen, what about you? What was the question again? <laughs> the question was, where your character is now, how did that differ from your original notion of the character when you first heard about the show or, or read the script? Oh. You're spelling my name wrong. Um, <laughs> um, so. <laughs> it begins. Uh, Diva. For, for those watching the video, the captioner just apologized. 
<laughs> um. Caption guy's fired. <laughs> Jalen, you just got the caption guy fired. <laughs> How does that make you feel? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, Pearl is a whale, <laughs> and um, and. In the beginning, I was like, okay, so they're about to have me in a mascot. I'm at the this big pearl whale looking thing, right? So I came into the that's what that was my first, that was my mindset coming into the first rehearsal. So after a while, I was like, this is literally like me with like platform shoes on <laughs> and and just a and a hair that the only thing personally on my body that makes me think that I'm a whale are the platform shoes and the hair. Like, it, uh, other than that, you you just think of me, you know what I mean? Or a pearl. But um, but I, <laughs> I have this, um, what, what would you call it, J Janelle Mon Monet type of bouffant type of hairdo that symbolizes the, the what's it called? The, the, what's the, the thing snout. that the whale, the snout? Is it a snout? A, Someone? a, a head? Face? Head. 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 <laughs> quick, quick, it's got a mouth Google, and two Google. eyes and a nose. What is that thing? Yeah, I think it's a face. It's a face. <laughs> so the, that thing uh, is my for for me is the hair, and so it it's it's like this large thing. It kind of I think that it looks kind of like a um, like a over the top Elvis uh, pompadour. Yeah, but it's not. Uh, and the the platforms make me taller than everyone besides, I mean, when Alex is on the stage, then I'm really not, but he's one of our, our peoples. Um, <laughs> but it makes me taller than everyone on the stage, and um, in the beginning, I thought that it was going to be a mascot, but it's basically, I'm just a cheerleader and, and uh, platform shoes and a, and a good hairdo. <laughs> <laughs> Does yeah. that answer the question? Not really, but it's okay. <laughs> As, we danced around it, but we got the idea. We got the idea. Okay, Thank go. you all for joining us. <laughs> you now, go. That's all the time we have. Thank <laughs> you. Um, they're getting all of it. I mean, you know, of course, with, with, with Mr. Krabs, there's, there's definitely uh, the money Tourette's that is very obvious in the, um, in the cartoon itself. And... And I think for me, approaching approaching the character, finding a way to to justify that, I I think I more or less just started approaching him as a as a single father, uh, who has a daughter that is getting bigger every day, and and it takes a lot of money to feed a growing child. So I, I think that was a my growing. way of connecting those dots and, and grounding it to something a little more human than just money, 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 which is, uh, which is you know, very much the cartoon. I also have an eye patch that is yes. symbol, uh, my human interpretation of the one eye plankton. And so. two little braids. And two little, like Steven Seagal samurai braids yeah, yeah. <laughs> that are represented my antenna. Yeah. I, I, it's funny, none of you guys, uh, I guess Jalen, a little bit, you talked about it, but the, the, the costumes, I went into the show and I was like, how are they going to do these animals on stage? <laughs> Especially like a whale and a plankton and whatnot. And because that's obviously a lot, of, a lot of different thoughts. And um, David Zinn uh, designed both costumes and the set. We'll get in the set in a little bit. But the costumes are, are super complex in their simplicity. If that makes sense, like Brian, you talk about your your claws for a second. Yeah, I mean, uh, my my costume looks like it could be any guy who runs a deli in New York, uh, with with the exception of uh, these huge, oversized, uh, massive boxing gloves, uh, which are representative of of the crab claws. Uh, yes, I wear a necklace. Thank you, Jalen. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, so so it's really I think I think what David Zen and what one of the things we talked a lot about uh, in the in the concept of the design is that it's it's less about trying to be these animals as it is as it is creating the silhouette of uh, the the characters that you know and love and those you put those gloves on and it's it's almost immediate you just fall into a deep squat and hold your arms out and that's it you you've already done it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Once you put on the, I mean, the platform's like really high, so like you can't help but to feel like a, like a skyscraper. So, just like, 
Yeah, just like he falls into his little Yeah, spot. there are some costumes that physically sort of force you to become these animals that are on the show. Like, we have a Larry the Lobster, and he yeah. has this very big sort of, like, muscle suit. And so he can't actually walk around with his arms down because there are there's just so much of his costume. So he walks around like this, like a big lobster would. Yeah. Um, so some of the costumes physically sort of force us to be to embody our animals. I enjoy that SpongeBob actually is just... You know, people in in overalls and although Ethan's body is already yeah, kind of shaped sp- like a square, yeah. like he, I mean, his torso is like I mean, it's he's perfect. Ethan. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's Ethan. He's good. Yeah, Curtis, you said you had. Lit- do you literally have thirty-two costume changes, or was that an exaggeration? It's like twenty-three or yeah. twenty-three. Yeah, it's it's pretty insane. Um, but w- some of the costumes are sort of taken out of like the the visual um, aspect of it. Like I play, um, there's a rock band that comes to Bikini Bottom to help raise money to save the town um, called the Electric Skates. And so I play one of the one of the singers in the rock band, um, and we are skate fish. And so we are on various types of skates. So I roller skate. Or skateboarding, so it's just sort of taken out of context, made it a little more abstract in that way. But it, it's so fun for me. In in like, there's another character that I play named Coneface, who is a crustacean, and he I literally am like this the whole time, and I wear a traffic cone on my face with two tennis balls as eyeballs. So like, you know, you get you get a creature out of out of that. But with the skates, it's a little more up to it. Like, yes, we're wearing skates, but it's more up to like I. I actually, before we started rehearsal, was in Mexico and I was snorkeling and I found a skate fish and I just started following around. They're so disgusting. <laughs> like the way that they like slither on the bottom of the ocean and they're just like, re- they're like this weird gray color. And so I think about that every time I'm in the, you know, on my skates and like something as simple as just like a stop. Like when I stop, I like, whoosh, you know, like do like, it just becomes part of my physicality. You know, like stuff like that. Or like the guitar that we're carrying, if I'm wearing it on my back, it's like my fin. You know, so we get to be a little more creative in some of the costumes. It's sort of a genius playground yeah. in terms of what David Zinn has established for us. And it's like, like no offense to like Disney or whatever, but it could have been, it could have been a very safe, expected sort of uh, very big budget blockbuster set costume sort of thing with like a rain curtain and like actual more obvious things Mm -hmm. when it comes to like under the sea kind of production value. But the genius of the show is, is how creative and inventive it is making, I mean the set and the costumes are like assembled junk. So like stuff that you would find at the bottom of the ocean is what has made up our set. So pool noodles are kelp and uh, hula hoops are corals. And, you know, instead of just like the obvious, like trying to recreate it, um, it's it's forcing the audience to use their imagination. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, And that goes with the costume design as well. It's just a bunch of stuff that's made into like a traffic cone and a a golf ball or uh, what tennis balls, whatever. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) My mom, just just to piggyback off of what he said, my mom said, like, this is Nickelodeon. Ain't they like a billion dollar company, right? So we could have been underwater for all they wanted. Like, if they really wanted, if they really wanted a blockbuster thing, we could have been swimming. Electric skates could have been some electric skates. (laughs) Like, but like. (laughs) I don't. Like, oh, you mean like real animals? Skates are. Isn't that a um? What's the thing that? With the t- a skate fish? No. Like a stingray? Stingray! Yeah. And <laughs> but they're not stingrays. <laughs> yes, they are. No, stingrays. they're skate fish. They're different. <laughs> they look Wait, similar, but they're different. Those stingray degenerates. All right. So, keep going, keep going, keep going. So, I want to I back, so back up for a second. <laughs> Let's talk about, I want to talk about the set. You mentioned the set, the pool noodles, the hula, the hula hoops, all those amazing thing, things. The set itself is like a giant Rube Goldberg machine. It's yeah. incredible. Oh. Um, and there was actual bubble design that went into the set. And does anybody, can anybody speak to that? Do you guys know about the set? About the... Like the gazillion bubble show, the, that off-Broadway show, yeah. that crew actually designed your bubbles. Did you know that? No. no. Yes. I, I didn't that know that. The yes. End? Yeah. D- yeah, no, no I do. I, am not. I do know that we went through like a lot. We went through Spoiler. a whole sort Spoiler of. Spoiler alert! Bubbles come out at the end. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. You're under Wait, the you sea. No, no, I am not. Like they designed the bubbles that 
or where our yeah to make to make sure that all of the bubbles adequately fill the house and look as appropriate as Tina wanted it to be. Yeah. They hired the gazillion bubbles crew, so, and so that, that, that they wouldn't that come down on the ground and we we would slip on them. Like it's yeah. a very specific kind of yeah. bubble oh. that isn't dangerous for us. Yeah, it's like that hurts your eyes when you, when, you, like, when it gets in your eye yeah. like it tastes bad it wasn't fun <laughs> it was really bad just well, chilling on stage I guess yeah I guess no one can speak to that cool um Sorry. it's cool you're talking about like Nickelodeon billion dollar business right so I think all the money went into the score um that, that's just my guess the, for those of you who don't know um and I'm being slightly facetious um, those of you who don't know, it, this is again nominated for Best Original Score. Um, the music was written by a slew of people. I think almost every song was written by somebody different, mm -hmm. including, uh, for example, David Bowie, Flaming Lips, Sarah Bareilles, John yeah. Legend, Panic at the Disco, They Might Be Giants, Cindy Lauper, it goes on. Every song is different, every song is unique. Uh, how does, did, when you heard all of this music come together for the first time, did that, like, what, what was your first impressions of everything when you were finally hearing all this? Well, I, I was very lucky to be a part of the project uh, from one of the early labs. So the first lab that we did was, uh, I want to say, six years ago. And we didn't have a complete script yet. It was just to show part of what the show could possibly be to Viacom for them to write another check for the next workshop and out of town and all that stuff. So we had songs literally like rolling in throughout that rehearsal process. And it was pretty incredible. Tina would reach out to the songwriter and basically give them like a title of what the song could be and a couple thoughts. And like the next day we'd have a complete song to learn. And almost every song that was was submitted is like still the song that's there now. It's pretty pretty incredible, like first draft yeah. situation. Um and they're they're all completely different, right? Like they have to be. And Tina's thought behind that was that the show feels the cartoon feels like you know very like spastic and and things are happening that are not cohesive in a way so she wanted the score to feel that way too that it was very like you know coming from different genres and has this ever been done before where they source that many different songwriters for a single show I don't there's think there's obviously so. been jukebox musicals before right, but this right. is not a jukebox i mean this is truly they were assigned like Panic at the Disco, you get the I Want number. You get the I Want song, the, the third song of the evening where SpongeBob dreams and wants, you know, what he wants for the whole show. Uh, John Legend, you get the Act Two ballad between the two friends. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. they were each assigned a specific part of the show to to write for, and I don't, I, no, I don't think that's ever been done. Mm -mm. That's incredible. So, but yeah, Curtis and Lily, you two have been um, in it since Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so how... It was in Chicago, opened in Chicago in 2016, right? Yeah, summer yeah. of 2016. Yeah, and then, so how long did it run there? About two, a month and a half or two months, oh, like including previews. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't very long. And then how did it change, how did it change when it came to New York? Um, it's changed a lot. Uh, me. And a little. He's <laughs> here, so. Besides the, the cat. worst, you know. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's changed a lot and a little. I mean, the story overall is pretty much the same. Uh, I think it's just gotten better. It's gotten tighter. It's gotten funnier. Uh, some amazing people have been added to the cast. The music has actually changed quite a bit lyrically. Uh, all the same songs are the same. Um, Tom Kitt is the brilliance that has created the through line of all of the different genres. Um, he's our orchestrator and arranger, and he uh, s has created such an incredible way of incorporating every different genre of these songs and making them work seamlessly. It's, it's sort of, it, it reminds me a lot of like a, a movie soundtrack. And I think the storytelling in it, in a way, is very cinematic in that way, that we can have all of these different genres, but it just works so seamlessly because it works with what the emotion of whatever scene is happening in the moment. So, uh, but yeah, going back to Chicago, a lot of, a lot of the lyrics have changed, um, but overall I just think it's like better and, yeah. and smarter and funnier. Well, when we started rehearsal for the New York production, Tina said that she had one of her director friends come to see the show and she was like, everything is amazing and everything goes on for too long. So we basically just like made little trims like in the show to every number so that things like like hit you in the face and then like we're on to something else. So it doesn't just linger too long in one song or one, mm -hmm. you know, scenic 
element. We added a lot of dance breaks. A lot of dance breaks, a speed rap. Which are amazing. Speed rap? A speed, does a speed rap. rap. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Um, so do I have it, I have a question it. about the Foley design here in a second. But if anybody in the audience has questions, we have two mics in the aisles. So you can start lining up there, and we'll, we'll go to audience questions in a bit. Um, the Foley design. For those who don't know, what is Foley? Foley's the, you know, the sound effects is someone who's actually making the sound of, like, when you walk, they're making the, I'm not being articulate. Can yeah, you? it's just a person making the sound effects live. Yeah, yeah. Like, thank you. Like, in, in movies. When he basically orchestrates, like, people's performances. So, like, when SpongeBob walks, like, the squeaky walks, like, any time I walk, he is right there with me going. Well, when I do karate chops, you hear that. Yeah. And there's all him pressing do do? buttons. Everybody and do stuff stones. live, right? I'm sorry. Do you do, don't you do Foley noises live? Some of the noises live on stage? No. Or did you no, record it, them? No, he does them for oh, he does. us. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I know no, it, it comes across anyway. like we're doing. He has this, about a million cues. Yeah. Uh, over a million cues. That he's like wow. one of the most valuable people in that building. Yeah, like I stomp and he makes the makes it sound like the place is shaking. Um, I don't know how to ex- elaborate on that. Like It's a low, ru- a low rumble. Yeah, a low rumble yeah. every time I walk. It's the, the low end of the music that makes the 10th floor here hate us when we do musical events. Yeah. Um, we're on the 11th floor, by the way. So uh, talking about uh, show reactions for a little bit, um, again, we, we got into your own misconceptions, but like for like me personally, I went, I said, oh, they're doing SpongeBob, what? And then I went to see the show, and I was like, okay, this show, set's cool. Let's get into the numbers. And then I, I started listening and watching the show, and I was like, this works. This is Brilliant and perfect, and that was my own perfect reaction. It's now like one of my all-time favorite shows. And are you are you finding that's consistent through your friends or through your through your the reactions you yeah, hear I, I outside? I think I think that's a reaction we get a lot. You know, I, I I one 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 of the ways it was put once is that our our greatest our greatest asset and our greatest liability is the name because people have a very preconceived notion of what that's going to be. Mm-hmm. And you know, y- there are a lot of people who are like. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go see that. But you know, you, you're definitely gonna have those people who are like, SpongeBob, what big question mark? But I don't know anybody who had reservations who hasn't come to the show and ended up believing, loving it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very telling. And I think that's a uh, pretty, pretty broad yeah. for most people. I, uh, I I feel very. This question is like a hot topic for me because I I feel very protective and. Uh-huh. Um, defensive when it comes to uh, this show because I believe in it so fully but also because uh, I feel like there's a lot of people who who have opinions about what deserves to be on Broadway which I think is so silly because um, the the idea that a brand name couldn't be creative or artistically valuable is so absurd to me like the fact that the band's visit is the only musical right now that's allowed to be artistically worthy is ridiculous. Um, if you go see our show, you'll know that it's the most creative, inventive show that you've seen on Broadway, in my opinion. Um, and I, I, you know, I went to drama school, and I thought I was like Daniel Day Lewis when I graduated. Like I took, I took myself very seriously as an actor. And <laughs> the first job I got out of school was Rock of Ages, this like '80s jukebox, trashy like bubblegum rock musical um, and I was actually embarrassed to invite my faculty to it because I thought it was less than I was still in that snobby bubble um, and they came and they were like what are you talking about this is the training like this is comedy technique at its fullest this is if you can't identify that the work is in all art and that like anywho I um, I feel like I feel like my career my career since graduating drama school has been the people show has been like Rock of Ages the Adams family SpongeBob SquarePants not the band's visit not next to normal and like the artistically worthy you know artistically worthy shows and I I find that you know with this show it's such a like he said I I, it, I I'm pressed to find anyone who comes and sees our show and leaves without having their opinion changed their original opinion and of coming into the theater with their arms crossed hoping to not enjoy this mm-hmm. corporate experience. <laughs> right. 
Uh. And it's sort of the best reaction we can get, right? Like people come in sort of wanting to hate the show. A lot of people have told me that they've come to the show wanting to hate it, and then they just simply cannot. And they sit there with their arms crossed, and then they start to smile, and they start to rock out, and then they start to cry, <laughs> because it just creeps up on you, and it's so good. So it's a, it's a great reaction that people come mm. thinking it's not going to be good, and realizing, oh wait, I was totally wrong, and this is creative and smart and inventive and wonderful. We're all presently, ple- very pleasantly surprised with how the community has accept us with the like the Tony nominations and the in the rave reviews and everything because it could have gone the other way. I mean, yeah. it's a stigma with the title mm-hmm. and for people to want to embrace it. I, I, it's also another thing to remind ourselves and everybody and viewers and people who haven't seen it is I, I think a preconceived notion that is actually incorrect is that we are just sort of replicating a TV show and a story that's already been done and it's a jukebox musical. It's none of those things. It's a completely original story and it has completely original music and lyrics and everything about it is new and has never been done before. So it's not just, uh, you know, a TV show that's being put onto stage or a movie that's being put onto the stage. And I think just like this series, you know, in terms of it being like this, yes, it's an original story, but it's also, you know, it's not just for kids, you know, it's, it's, there's definitely a lot for kids. um, But, just like the series, there is super subversive adult humor, adult topics. We are covering ground. Ever like, give me some examples, guys. Gun violence. You oh. know, gun everything from gun violence to global warming. To uh, I, I don't. I mean, I, I don't know a more politically relevant musical right now on Broadway. Exactly. It is for Trump's America in the truest sense, and it's not even subtle. It's Government versus very, media. It's is... not nuanced at all. It's like <laughs> hitting the audience over the head with it, but it, in the best way. I mean, My... I, I literally say the lines like, you're not welcome you're not here. Welcome. No, no, I say, uh, you're not even from here. Like, why should we trust you? Like, the, it's huge conversations about inclusion, science, because uh, Sandy is obviously pro-science, and the antagonist characters are not, are anti-science. Science versus, well, you're married to a computer. I am married to a computer, so you would think. Yeah. You, you would think. Yeah. Um, but I, I challenge her science, and I say, oh, next she's going to tell us that tidal warming is real. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very sinister turn you made to me. <laughs> I was going to ask about that. The, the the audience reaction has does it differ from the kids and the adults? But it sounds like you you very clearly answered that. Do do the do Elizabeth the Fincentelli, who's the the main critic for the Post, just uh, tweeted. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, but she just tweeted. It's it's a show from it's a show for people ages six to ninety six. And I was like, well, don't discriminate against the ninety seven year old, you know. <laughs> but it was basically like, and every age will enjoy the show. Mm-hmm. Like it is that. That's sort of special. My father broke out in tears. I rarely see my father cry. Um, but he came to the opening. And no, 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 he came a, a few shows after. And that was like right when we added the head shake to the gun. And well, the, 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 the jellyfish gun. Mm-hmm. And my father was like, at the end of the show, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys just, you guys shook your head at the gun, right? I was like, yeah, dad, we, you know, we're, we're shaking our head to the gun. And he was like, wow. Because my, my father, he's like a Georgia guy, Southern. Like he had, he had that. Of course, he was happy that his baby girl was in a, a Broadway musical. But like, but this like, is your debut, debut by the way. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but but he was like, but of course the title. So he was like SpongeBob. You know, I'm gonna. It was always in the back of his head. But he was like. You guys just shook your head to a, a gun. It was mm-hmm. just so much stuff that he was very happy about. Our mayor, our mayor character has plenty of lines about don't trust the dishonest media. Um, she's tweeting at the beginning of the musical instead of governing. <laughs> she is. I mean, it's 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 very obvious everything yeah. that's happening and uh, and clear Tina's sort of intention for yeah. the show. What's interesting about that though is that most of the politicalness of the show was there in Chicago. Mm. And the show, we were supposed to come right in after our out-of-town tryout. Like, we were, we closed in July, and we were supposed to come in in September. And then just getting a theater in New York is incredibly complicated and difficult. So it happened a year and a half later, and the show didn't change much in terms of that, but it's like our show was a little bit ahead of its time. 
and it's actually made the show more important. Just the timing of, mm-hmm. of when our show has come in. Right, like our show hasn't changed that much, but our world has changed yeah. so much. And the and things that were in the show, political wise, political wise, sure, um, <laughs> were things that at the time we were like, oh, that's so ridiculous. Yeah. That'll never happen. Yeah. And then. Look what happened. Yeah, yeah. Look at our world. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I want to quickly acknowledge Brian, this is also your debut as well, your Broadway yeah, debut. Yeah, so yeah. congratulations yeah. to, to both you. of you. I didn't forget, don't worry. Um, I think you have a question over here. Uh, can everyone of you share uh, how did you end up with this job and what was your interviews like for this job? <laughs> Tell us about your interview. That's so funny, Jalen just asked all of the Google people, how did you get this job? <laughs> She actually asked they me have how, a slide how we auditioned. Here. For yeah, yeah. How did you audition yeah. for Google? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, they took out the slide, but they have a rock climbing wall place. Um, I sort of, I, I sort of answered this question kind of already, but um, I, I was not a part of the show like, like they were. Uh, well, me, Brian, and Jalen are new, so those two down there and me are, are brand new to the show, um, and. I auditioned for the show actually a couple of years ago and it was between me and another guy who ended up getting the part and he did it in Chicago. Um, so, uh, but I'm actually glad that that happened because like I moved to LA and I experienced some things that I wanted to experience in my life. So um, it sort of worked out how it was supposed to work out and I'm, I'm playing the part now. Um, so, uh, and it was strange cause I was living in LA and uh, I got a, I got an email saying they'd like you to come in for this final reading before Broadway. No guarantees, but this could translate to an offer for the production. And so I, I came in and did this three-day workshop and uh, flew back to L.A., got off the plane, and, and they called and said that I got the part. Um, and so then I moved back to New York um, to, to start rehearsals in September. And that's how it went for me. So that was my audition was the three-day reading. I had uh, three auditions, I believe, um, and it was probably the funnest experience I've had at an audition ever in my life because the, the, the setting that Tina created in the audition room is just so fun and safe and welcoming. And you can't really say that about every audition that you go to. Sometimes you walk into a room of, of very cold people behind a table and you feel like you have to impress them as opposed to like collaborating with people. And, and Tina would throw a bunch of fun things at us and I had to make up a karate dance on the spot and um, (laughs) Ethan Slater who plays Spongebob and I went to college together and he was in the room for my audition and so we got to read together which was really wonderful and we obviously had like a great history and chemistry together so it was just a safe fun thoroughly enjoyable creative experience. Um, My journey is a little bit different with the show Um, I didn't actually audition for this this show or this production, um, I had worked with Tina before, and she just back six years ago when she wanted to experiment, and we did what were called movement labs to see how these characters could move and translate, you know, in a human form. Um, she called me and asked me if I would just be involved. So I did a couple different labs readings and the out of town. And while I didn't audition, every time I was in one of those readings, labs, or workshops, I felt like I was auditioning because every time they could replace me or hire someone new if they wanted to. So it was always sort of like, okay, what can I bring this time that will make me irreplaceable? The roller skates did it. (laughs) (laughs) Jalen? Oh, um, Oh, you have a great story. Oh, yeah. So (laughs) so I I was, um, I... I was in New York. I was doing a um, intensive. It was, I was g- getting ready to go into my sophomore year of college, and I was, I was at a master class, and it was the ma- a master class that Tom Kitt was uh, the, the one who was um, orchestrating the master class, and I sang for him. And my friend in the back was like recording. I didn't even know that he was like recording the, the video of it of of the whole master class. And I found it like three days later, and it like went viral like for two days. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but after all of that was happened, I was done with um, the master class. It was but I was like I was in a was in a car going to uh, Guardia, and I got a call that they wanted. <laughs> 
Oh, I, that is very specific. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got a call, and they were like, "We want you to, um, we want you to come in and audition." Because I didn't know that Tom, I didn't know that Mr. Tom was um, was the uh, person who was on the directive team, and um, that's fine. Keep going. You're go doing on. so good. <laughs> <laughs> so I. I went and auditioned, and I was like, you know what? I need to get ready for school. So after all of this, I was like, I went back to Georgia with the mindset of school, and uh, I got the call to do a reading, and that's where I met Wesley. And, <laughs> <laughs> and oh, and I met all of these people. <laughs> no, no, just me. Just me. <laughs> and uh, after that three-day reading. I didn't, I didn't do the Yes, you did. No, he didn't. Remember, it was the other guy. <laughs> Remember, the little guy? Like, oh, it was the old guy. Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't mean, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Anyway, so I, was going, I went home, and I went, <laughs> I went home, and I got the call, like, two days later after me being uh, home in Georgia. It was very, um, it was a very weird process. And when I was home, because I, I was like, I need to go back to college. But um, but I didn't, so. <laughs> so here we are. Top Brian. that, Brian. Yep. It started when I was five. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I went through a, a three audition process. Uh, very late in the game. I mean, the, the show was opening, uh, was starting rehearsals in about, um, I think, um, two months when I first started going in. So they were they were clearly looking for, you know, uh, just a couple of very specific things. And, um, you know, at the time I was, I was actually in for uh, a handful of other uh, projects as well that were very serious. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And every time I would go in, and it would it would just be this kind of dark, brooding, a lot of whispering behind the table. And then I would go in for Tina and the creatives at SpongeBob, and it was it was just this beautiful room of of warm, compassionate people who were like, "Hey, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna play a little bit. You want to play?" <laughs> and uh, and so, so every every week as I was going through these processes, I slowly started sabotaging the other ones and going in, going, please be SpongeBob, please be SpongeBob, and uh, and yeah, when I when I when I got the call, it was a, a pretty beautiful day, and I'm uh, I get to share that with some pretty beautiful people too. Oh, uh, about the audition process. <laughs> I just want to like piggyback off of what everyone has said. It was. I was so blessed to have this have been my my first audition because like of course if I auditioned for anything else I'm pretty sure that it's not going to be the same experience. I walked in thinking okay this they're going to be behind that table and it's going to be they're going to not have any smiles on their face and faces and I, I walked in and they had the music playing and Tina was like in these jogging, well, she's always in like in these like jogging pants and like hair wild. And like at first, before I had like this really weird thought that they had SpongeBob behind the table, but it was actually Kenneth. Kenneth is our like <laughs> assistant. I thought that they, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> you thought, again, tangent. This Kenneth is our, was so, our associate, associate was, director, who's got like tall blonde hair. I thought he was. I thought he was. I thought they had SpongeBob already in the room, but for me, it just felt so good because I'm already like a wacky, crazy girl. You know what I mean? Yeah. You? <laughs> you? <laughs> really? Anyway, it was just a beautiful experience. This is your last interview. Oh, <laughs> ever. <laughs> They, you know they love her. She <laughs> she is the youngest of the cast. This dynamic has been throughout the whole day or everything. This is a beautiful, beautiful cast, and they do. We all love each other. Yeah. Um, we're running short on time. <laughs> we are running short on time, so we can take. Sorry, just one more question over here. Thank you all so much for coming. I love musical theater, and I'm a singer too. So I want to know what would be your dream role in a musical, past, present, or future. Mm -hmm. Fun. Great question. Google the musical. Uh, mine is, um, this is hopefully a long time from now, but I, I'm, I would love to play Mrs. Lovett in Sweeney Todd. Wow. Mm. That's really good. Um, 
I got to play one of my dream roles a couple years ago. I was the MC in Cabaret uh, down in D.C., and I would love to do that again. Uh, I still got another 10 years. You know, like, I played it pretty young, so I would like to have another shot at that. Um, and also, like, Floyd Collins, which is a musical that Tina wrote, actually, our director. She wrote the book to it, and I think that's one of the most gorgeous musicals ever written. Uh, and I don't know if I could sing it, but I, I, I would want... Thank you. That's what I was waiting for. <laughs> you can do anything you want. I have a couple. Um, when I was 13 years old, I saw the national tour of West Side Story it came through my hometown of San Antonio, Texas. Um, and it was such a magical evening, and I thought that's what I have to do for the rest of my life. And I saw Christian Borle, if anyone knows who Christian Borle is. Play, he played thing. Riff in this production, and Stephen Pasquale played Tony. So it was like a pretty like magical experience that I didn't know I was having. Um, and so the the two... 2009 revival happened with Arthur Lawrence, who wrote West Side Story. He directed our production. He was 91 years old, um, and I was hired for that production. It was sort of like full circle moment. So Riff and West Side Story, and then Cosmo and Singing in the Rain, yeah. the Donald O'Connor part, which I got to do um, out of town, which with Tony Yazbek as um, as Don, the two of us together. It was really awesome. Original Gene Kelly tap choreography. It was wow. it was incredible. I have a really weird um, dream role which is the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. Yeah! I just, like, I just think it'd be so fun, like, the physicality of, of that. and um, So that's the one that I'm, I'm waiting for. You heard it here. Skip me. <laughs> I mean, as a character guy, I, I, it's, it's hard for me to, do, to pick one. Uh, I would love to play Sweeney just once. Um, and uh, uh, Nathan Detroit uh, in Guys and Dolls. Uh, I would... But I think I think my biggest one is I would love to do Shrek. Ooh. Hello, donkey. Yeah. Just just once I'd like to do Shrek. So good. Um, you should do that. Yeah. I uh, forgive me because uh, I might not know the names to these people uh, to the characters. Forgive me, but um, dream role. My dream role. I I'd love to 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 do um I would love to sing Metal Arc. Please help me cuz you guys know. Um I would love to sing Metal Arc. Um uh you don't know from next to normal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and you I'd love be, to be You should be Kate and Wild Party. Kate and Wild Party. I would love to do that. And um, I, I, oh, for some reason, I just want to be Suge Avery. Oh, oh yeah, God. that'd be so perfect. Yes, that'd you be should do that. that Suge yeah. Avery. There you go. Suge Avery. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Everybody, uh, please go to the Palace Theater, the beautiful Palace Theater, 47th and Broadway. You can visit them online, spongebobbroadway.com, on Instagram and Twitter, at SpongeBob Broad, SpongeBob B Way. And then uh, we actually have one more song that they will perform for us here. <gasps> Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody help me uh, give them a round of applause. <laughs> so I will leave the stage after I introduce this. This song is called Simple Sponge, sung, sung by SpongeBob. So uh, a fry cook at the Krusty Krab, SpongeBob dreams of becoming a manager one day, but few believe in his ambitions. Before SpongeBob can rally his best friends, Sandy and Patrick, to take on Mount Humongous, he needs to give himself a little pep talk. Here to sing Simple Sponge, one final time on stage, Curtis Holbrook. Sure, I spend my days floating around, head in the bubbles and my feet on the ground. But there is more to me than just my name. Give me a chance and I can change the game. And maybe one day, Mr. Krabs, you'll say, The Krusty Krab is yours, it's your lucky day. That is what I've always wanted. Then I can finally say I've done it. Let me have adventure, be a contender, and more Cause you're not a simple sponge I wish he'd see I'm not just the sponge next door No, you're not a simple sponge 
there's got to be a better way, a way to save this town I love. But how can I stop the end of the world? Am I just a simple sponge? So what if I'm a sponge? It's what I want to be. There isn't anyone who stretches like me. Employee of the month two years in a row. Undisputed master of my own dojo. And everyone here knows that they can depend on this expert jellyfisher who's a trusted friend. I can eat a lot of ice cream. I can even play my nose like, let me have adventure, be a contender, and I'm not just the sponge next door I wish that I could turn back time I never thought my world could end I only want to hang out with my friends But fear I fear is dragging us down And now there's panic that's run amok in my simple town Just give me adventure, I'm a contender and more I will show I'm not just a sponge next door I'm gonna find a better way, a way to save the life I love And I am gonna stop the end of the... No! You're just a simple sponge. No, Mr. Krabs, I will find a way to stop that volcano. Will you science, like Sandy said? You are still a simple sponge. We can use her jetpack to get to the top. Oh, wait, pretty sure it's only built See, for one. You are a simple sponge. We'll have to climb it then. Patrick can help with that. He's super strong. Sandy's brains, plus Patrick's brawn, plus mine. Yes, a very simple sponge. I'm not sure what my thing is, but that won't stop me. When the going gets tough, this sponge gets going. No, I'm not a simple sponge. I am not a simple sponge. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, so wonderful. Thank you. All right, let's go eat Froyo. <laughs>